celebration. And by the way, this is the point in the service where my mother would take over and should tell you that there's some seats down here. There's a couple seats down front. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. So come on down. And uh, the rest of you kind of uh, breathe in. And there's some room maybe in some of the aisles. And I think we can all find a seat here this afternoon for this three-hour service. So um, that should motivate you. But again, I, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Oh my. I think we got seats for everyone. So please find those seats as we prepare. Now, another thing my mother would do is that she would interrupt the service at any point that she felt something wasn't being done right. And uh, she would try to remedy that. So I have seven announcements to make before we begin. And if I can make these all and, and make them clearly, uh, maybe she will not re, uh, interrupt and remind us that we need to attend to these things. But first I point out that this is a service of celebration as well as a service of remembrance. And in celebration, my sister Linda had the idea that wouldn't it be good if we would dress like mom dressed, with a little bit of, uh, of color and um, elegance and uh, bling. And so you'll see some of our family members, you'll wonder, did they remember they're going to a funeral this morning? Well, they remembered they were going to my mother's funeral. And I, I actually had to show you the last present I got from my mother. <laughs> this is a tie. You know, subtle, subtle as it is. And, um, but we're here to celebrate her life as well as worship our Lord. Um, those announcements on the book table, my mother wrote over 50 books. Many of them are on the table. Her uh, former editor, Gil Beers, is here from how many years ago? 62 years ago when he started writing for Gil. But anyways, there's a, um, a sheet there if you want to order one of those books. Not, we're not selling them. We just have some extras at home. So if there's a book there you'd like to have as a keepsake, we just ask you to fill out the form and leave it at the table, and we'll try to get that book to you. There will also be a video portrait at the conclusion of our service toward the end. And that will be um, featured on YouTube if you want to take a look. Give us a little time to get it up there. But you may want to use that or share that with those who are not able to be here this morning. Um, you'll notice that everyone is invited to the committal service at the Welsh um, Cemetery. However, I need to warn you, it's the middle of winter. There is limited parking and no sidewalks. I think it is a dangerous expedition um, to, to head there. So what I want to do is give you a good option. Following the service, you're all invited to a lunch that will be served up in Fellowship Hall. And um, so after the service, uh, as much of the family that can, will go to the um, committal service and we'll come back as soon as we can to join you for lunch. And if you want to know what the lunch is, if you ever had dinner at my parents' home, you might from, remind uh, some of these Items might be familiar to you, but you would have gotten lime jello. And so we have lime jello for you. We have meatloaf and her pasta salad. So we hope that you'll enjoy a lunch prepared by much of the family yesterday in her honor. Um, another announcement there's going to be a song a little later on by all the descendants of Marie. And we're going to invite you to just come forward at that time and bring a hymnal with you. And we're going to sing Trust and Obey, a song that she sang often this past year. And we're going to ask you to bring your own hymnal and sing the first, second, and fourth stanzas. First, second, and fourth stanzas. And there will be no sermon, since I'm already giving you one. Um, there will be no sermon during the service, because um, one of the things we reflected on is our mother's life was a sermon. But we will have a sharing time. And we hope to hear from some of you about some of the experiences that you had or remembrances you had that would tell us a little bit of the story of her life and her sermon that she lived. And finally, I need to make a recon recognition, excuse me, for the people who took care of my mother this past um, couple years, really out here at Big Rock and both at the house in West Chicago. And they became like family. She became their grandma. They became her granddaughters and caregivers. So if you were a caregiver and gave care to my parents, uh, mom and dad, in the last couple of years, would you stand right now? We'd like to recognize you. Thank you. Thank you. Now will you follow me in prayer? 
God, before whom generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all your servants who, having lived this life in faith, now live eternally with you. Especially we thank you for your servant, Hattie Marie, for the gift of her life, for the grace you have given her, for all in her that was good and kind and faithful. We thank you for her, and we know that in, pat, in death, pain is ended, and she has entered into the joy you have prepared for her. Stand by those in sorrow that, as they lean on your strength, they may be upheld and comforted by the good news of the life of the world to come. Give us faith to see beyond the touch and sight some sight of your kingdom, and where vision fails, to trust your love which never fails. Lift heavy sorrow and give us good hope in Jesus, so we may bravely walk our earthly way and look forward to the glad heavenly reunion through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was dead but is risen, to whom we give honor and praise now and forevermore. Amen. should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long? For heaven and home When Jesus is my portion A constant friend is he His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. And I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. sparrow and I know he watches me and I sing because I'm happy and I sing because And I know he watches. Yes, I know he watches. Yes, I know he watches me.
still on? Okay, good. Uh, reading. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Make me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me, the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. And surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Word of the Lord. Reading from the Gospel according to Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe all. I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. No one comes to the Father except through me. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. A reading from Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians. But we do not want you, uninformed brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as those do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not go in front of those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I'm going to invite a descendants of Marie Frost to come forward, bring your hymnal with you, and turn to 523. We're going to sing the first, second, and third, uh, I'm sorry, first, second, and fourth stanza of Trust, Don't Obey, a song that was on her lips.
we're going to invite, invite you to join us in singing hymn number 514. 514, Blessed Assurance, another favorite of my mother's. And we'll sing all three stanzas as we stand together to sing Blessed Assurance. Well, I warned you that my mother would interrupt this service, and I was sitting in this chair and something whispered to me, Gene, you forgot to thank some very important people. <laughs> so um, I do want to thank Big Rock Baptist Church for making this available to us, but also helping in the service and attending to it, their pastor and, and, and um, folks have just made us feel welcome here and uh, thrown their doors open to us. Of course, my dad served here 26 years as pastor. They worshiped here the last decade of their life, and we just want to thank Big Rock. And I also want to thank my home church, Faith Evangelical Covenant, that will be serving your lunch here today and just uh, working as servants in God's work. So I want to thank them. The eulogy this morning is going to be brief. I just wanted to highlight some of the loves of my mother's life. I titled it because there was no greater love here on earth than her daddy. And she, one of the 50 books she wrote, Had He Married a Preacher. And if you're ever around, especially in this past year, she wanted to know where daddy was. And where's daddy? And what's daddy up to? And I think my mom's love for my father was such a good example of what a family should be all about. He, she adored him. She would tell you he was the greatest preacher. He was even better than that classmate of my dad, that guy named Billy um, Graham. <laughs> you got to come and hear Gene preach. And that's what she told everybody. 
And that's what she told every church they built together, that daddy was a preacher. And she adored him and loved him. Now, we had a suspicion that we knew who really called the shots. But she always made it look good. And uh, would never put our dad off unless he tried to get her back to the farm. Now, that was one thing that she put her foot down on. But daddy was her first love. But she loved her kids. She loved each and every one of us in special ways. Um, I remember her love for me, and, and the thing that I want to focus on is when I would disappoint her, I'd do something very naughty, and I, I know my sisters both were betting on that I would end up in reform school before I got out of school, and, but you know, I would grieve her soul greatly, but you know, I'm, I'm really feeling bad about what I did, and mom, and you know what, mom would always turn it, that it didn't hurt her, it hurt Jesus, her, her savior. And boy, for a young child to realize the reality that God was in her life and the reality of God, what that meant for my life, that I, I needed to straighten up. Uh, you can make your own judgments. Um, but she loved us. She loved her kids, and she most of all wanted us to love her Jesus. She loved her church. We all grew up. That was the days of Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, uh, potlucks, salad supper. We were there for every kids' club and everything. And of course, she was there. She loved her churches. She loved her people in her church. She would welcome them. She would make them feel at home. She would um, invite people home for dinner. Uh, I just read a biography of a girl that lived with us during her high school years. And she first started by coming to our church and getting to know the family. And in the book as she's reading, she said, I, I got invited to this church and a very friendly pastor and a wonderfully friendly um, pastor's wife, and she invited us home for dinner for me, you know, this high school kid. She said, I was so privileged to be invited to the pastor's house home for dinner until I realized there were 20 other guests that Sunday. <laughs> she dedicated that book to her third mom, my mother. She loved her churches. She loved her friends. She loved her friends. She would call them on the phone. She'd meet them for coffee, um, especially if there's food involved. And, um, but she reached out to all sorts of people. She loved her friends, especially perhaps some in need. We often found our house full of guests, and sometimes they stayed overnight and for a week and, or a month or a year. And, um, but they were welcome. They were welcome. Every penny she ever made and my dad ever made was given away. Um, she, ran, she ran out of money when my dad passed away because she had no more governor on her giving. And so in this past year, some of you might know that we found some very authentic-looking fake money. <laughs> it looked like real stuff, you know, except for the Chinese insignia on the back. <laughs> and we put it in her purse because as she would visit with people, she would know that some of those people really needed a handout, needed us another little extra help. So she said, honey, get me my purse. And she would pull out a 20 or a 50 or if you really are in need, a 100. And she would give it to you. And they, we would thank her, of course. And of course, at the door, we'd give the money back and we'd go back in the purse. <laughs> but this was a giving heart. And I think about, talk about investments. Every penny she ever made was invested in heaven. And finally, she loved her Lord. She sang these songs this final year, and you'll see a couple times in the video. But she loved her Lord. And I'm just going to tell one story. We looked at a video taken about 15, 20 years ago, and we were asking questions of my mom and dad and about their life. And my mother said, I was always afraid of death. I grew up with a fear of death. I, I just always had a fear of death. I, I had a, a head knowledge of where I was going and how I was going to get there, but I still feared death. And, and I think it was her late 70s. She had a side ache one day, but she's not, it's not going to stop her, right? So when her appendix burst... She finally got to the hospital. Well, if you're that age and your appendix burst, that's serious stuff. And she struggled through that night, but she had this dream. And she told us this dream in the video. She had a dream and, and the light, there was a bright light and there was a peace. And there was, but then I, that, that thought gripped me again. What's my hope? I'm gonna, if I die, what, what's my hope? And she said, there was a figure there at my side. I said, Marie, don't worry. I'm here. I'm here to take you home. And she said she just had such a peace. And she said when she woke up that next morning, she said, I'm just going home. She said, I never feared death after that. That was such a wonderful experience. Of course, the doctor came in that room 
that day and said, Marie, we almost lost you last night. But it might not be your time. She loved her Lord. I'm going to close with something that was written on behalf of her kids for their 200th birthday. Some of you were there for that. My mom and dad were able to celebrate 200 years together, 99 and 101. And this was written on behalf for my mother, and there's copies of this in the back if you'd like to take one. There was nothing mom couldn't do. We always ate well, and the house was well kept. It seemed like there always had a house full of help from those in, our family, those in our family we took in. And of course, we all had our chores. It always seemed natural to be working for the family. After all, that's what mom was always doing. And work was never, never seemed drudgery for her. It was always an adventure, and so it was for us. This work ethic, along with the learned joy of work, was a gift that our mom imparted to all her children. She also imparted her passion for people. We always had guests staying with us, sometimes for a night, sometimes for a year. We would only later find out the story behind the guests being with us, such as our guest husband had run off with the other woman, or the fact that they just needed a new start. Each one of us children, much to the chagrin of our spouses, have at one time or another run a ministry center or boarding house for those in need of a helping hand. That was Hattie's hospitality reaching down through us. And it didn't just extend to hospitality. Mom had a heart of an evangelist. If Dad was late picking her up from the hairdresser, she would wander down the street, going house to house, asking if the neighbors if they had a church home or if they knew Jesus. I remember her getting letters, and when I inquired where she had met the person, she would explain that it was from the lady that she had just shared Jesus with on a recent flight or in the doctor's office waiting room. I always remembered her encouragement to never give up on people. She would tell us how to look, how it took seven invitations before the mother of our good friend Elizabeth Smith could be coaxed into coming to church. There she was saved and eventually her whole, whole family came to Christ. Professionally, Hattie Marie was an author, editor, speaker, teacher, evangelist, real estate broker, small businesswoman, of course, homemaker, mother, and pastor's wife. No wonder we think we can do anything we put our minds to. Thank you, Mom. So it's no secret that Mrs. Frost was, she loved and was loved by so many people. And that's one of the things that always really struck me about her is that she had such a big and beautiful family. And yet she always created room for more. I feel like if you spent any amount of time with her, you instantly became family. And I know that was true for my own family and for so many people here. Um, and so... The night before she moved on to be with our Lord, um, my dad kind of just had this urgency about him. He kept saying, we have to go to the house, we have to go to the house, and he asked us to sing over her, and so this is the song that we sang for her that night. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed The victory is won He is risen from the dead And I will rise when He calls 
calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagle's wings before my God. Fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. There's a day that's drawing near. When this darkness comes to light and the shadows disappear. And my faith shall be in my eyes. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when he calls my name no more sorrow no more pain I will rise on eagle's wings before my God fall on my knees and rise I will rise and I hear the voice sing worthy is the lamb and I hear the cry of every longing heart worthy is the lamb and I hear the voice of many angels sing worthy is the lamb and I hear the cry of every longing I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagle's wings before my God. Fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. Thank you. I told you there would not be a formal sermon in our service, but we would allow testimony time. And um, this is the time I invite you to give a short tribute or story or something you'd like to share about Marie. And we will take some time to, to hear from you and you share with us. And if possible, if you could come up, we're taping and this service would be great if you could come up. If not, speak loudly from where you are. So who will be first? This is the editor I talked about, and, um, and if you're going to come up, maybe you want to come up and stand by the, to be ready to come up next, so we can't hear from everybody, but we'd love to hear from many of you, so come on up, Gil. I don't think any of you family members know the story, and I think you should know the story. Marie spent 20 years, was it, at Cook? And uh, you wonder, how did Miss Scripture Press ever spend 20 years of her life at David C. Cook Company? Well, you're looking at the guy who did it. <laughs> so I need to tell you the story because it's a very important chapter in her life. It was 1957. 
I was 29, I'll save you the math, I'm 92 in May, and uh, I had been given the job of spending three months researching how Cook would ever get out of its mess. The year before, it had made $2,000 profit. It had been there since 1879. It used the International Series lessons, but never had its own curriculum. And Lee Vance, who was the brother-in-law of David C. Cook III, decided we've got to do something about this, and somehow he put his finger on me. And he asked me to do three months of research and come back and present to the executive team, how do we go forward? How do we get out of this? So I did, and I came back, and I said, first of all, we have to have our own curriculum. It has to be thoroughly evangelical, and the company has to decide once and for all to be evangelical, biblical in everything, and we've got to get the best people out there now. Well, that pointed a finger to people like Marie Frost. I needed her. And he said, you're the new editorial director and you develop the curriculum. Wow, I'm 29. I needed help. Spelled H-E-L-P. <laughs> but how could I ever get Miss Scripture Press to come to cook? That would be ridiculous. But then I heard through the grapevine that Marie wasn't as happy there as I thought she had been. So I called her and said, let's get together and talk, and we did. She didn't know me very well. And I said, um, how do you think things are going for you now? And she said, I'm not too happy. I said, oh, you want to tell me the story? And this is the story, and I doubt, Jane, that you folks know this. I developed, she said, a product on the side at Scripture Press, and when it came time to pay the royalty for that, Mrs. Corey took me aside and said, we can't pay you all that royalty. It's too much. It did better than we thought. Wow. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that publishers dream of. So she said, right now I'm not too happy. I said, well, how would you like to work for a company that would love to see you make money? How's that for a line? And she said, I would. And she came with me, and we spent 10 years together there. I think she was there another 10 years after I left. Ironically, eventually become president of Scripture Press. <laughs> So Marie and I had many wonderful times together, and a footnote to this story is she died at 104. Another team member, Charlie Van Ness, wrote to me two years ago, a beautiful letter. He was age 96. I just checked, and uh, L.A. Hance, who was another team member, is now 98, and I'm 39 and a half, <laughs> and lying my teeth on that. But there must be something in developing curriculum that gives you long life. So if you folks want to live long, sign up for developing curriculum. How many people know what that product was? Nope. Winky Bear. Winky Bear. I was in Germany smuggling Bibles. A German school teacher from the German public schools. I was talking about my mother. Somehow, Winky Bear came up. She said, Winky Bear! <laughs> we use that in our class. <laughs> International rock star. <laughs> Who else can share a story? I'm a talker, but not in front of a big crowd like this, so I'm going to do my best. I met Marie, I don't even know what year it was, and the minute I met her, she was a spunky person.
personality and I says, oh, you and I can be friends. I mean, we're just going to hit it off. And hit it off we did. And I, we used to go to their house after church and have wonderful dinners. And we just became such wonderful friends. I mean, I have cherished memories of Marie. Um, toward the end there, in the last couple of years, um, I would take her for rides. And I would come and we would go everywhere. You know, we'd go out, not maybe 10 minutes from here is a, a little stream and it, out in the country and it was beautiful and we'd roll the windows down and listen to the water. And she'd tell me, see the weeping willows coming down. And we just praised Jesus and we were so thankful that he's our Lord and our Savior. And she told us in Sunday school class, she says, you know, when I got married, I wasn't a born-again Christian. She says, I thought I was. I thought I knew what I was doing. And I was going to church and being a good person. But we, we, I love to witness. It's one of my favorite things. I got a lot of faults in my life, but witnessing is something I love to do in telling people how to get saved. And the two of us would talk, and she says, it, it, I don't remember exactly how it was, but she realized that salvation wasn't by good works, but it was a relationship with Jesus Christ. And she became a born-again Christian, and from that point on, her books and everything she did was telling people all about her Lord and Savior. And the memories that I had, she'd say, and it was so cute because toward the end there, when I'd take her and she'd say, bye, Daddy, and he'd say, bye, bye, Daddy, bye, Daddy, and they, there was like five byes, I love you, I love you, before we got in the car. It was so cute. And then one of the caretakers was a good friend of mine, and she says, we had to move the, their chairs together so that they would hold, could hold hands. And their love was so beautiful. It was so awesome. They had such a love. And she says, I'm going to live to be 135. She says, that's how old I'm going to be. And then when she lost her husband, she wanted to go right away and be with Daddy. Where's Daddy? Where is he? You know, and it was so priceless to have that kind of love. And then to have the family that she's had. I mean, massive amount of, and she loved every one of them. We'd talk, and she'd tell me how this one did that. And it was so precious. She was a very dear friend. And I know we'll be together in heaven someday. And I just... I just am very grateful that God led us together. I have something very short to, to say, but I'm Margaret Bell, and I really had the privilege of being a great friend. And for many years, and she would say, yeah, we're the same age, so you know what I mean. <laughs> so something you done, but she's very sweet, and I did help her write, and she spoke very often about Cook and all those wonderful days. But one day I decided I'd be a little bit of a smart Halleck, I guess, and help her out. So she wrote this poem, and it was so beautiful. And really, she was amazing. I mean, her mind, whoa! You know, she would come up with words like. The bees and the leaves and high pear leaves and the, the wine that was made of tar. I just throw that. Did you get that? N no, Marie, I didn't get that. I said, could you repeat it? No, I can't. <laughs> so, yes, she was, wow, wow. Well, anyway, we did, uh, so I decided one day I took the typing, I was doing the typing at home and I said, oh, this isn't, this isn't good grammar, so I'll change it. And after all, she's 101, she won't notice. <laughs> So I brought her back the next morning. He said, there you are, Marie. There's it all. And she read all the pages. And then she goes, hmm. She looked at me and she says, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said, well, Marie, I, I just thought I'd... She said, Margaret, don't mess with me. <laughs> I was thrown under the bus. Let me tell you, I was humbled. I said, Marie, I apologize. You're right. I was hoping you wouldn't notice. Oh, yeah. Don't mess with me. <laughs> Whoa. But the one thing I loved about Marie when I was with her all the time was, though she had everything and could have everything, she had one eye on 
present tense and love flowers and bling or whatever. But she always had her eye on Jesus, on the fact that we're going home. This world is not what it's all about. And I love that. We are all going home. And she knew that. And uh, that was her, her destiny. She knew it. She said, yes, I love Daddy. I love my family. I've been so blessed. But I, I know where I'm going. And though I appreciate everything I have, I know where I'm going. And I want you to know today that Marie would love you to all know that same assurance because it was Jesus is alive and he loves us. And that is the truth. So thank you, Marie, and thank you all. Hi there, my name is Jim, and I'm married to Marie's great-granddaughter, Sharon. And um, before Sharon and I were dating, I knew knew Grandma Frost from from church, and I would would sometimes go, when Sharon was helping, taking care of her, I would go go visit Marie, um, and she was always really glad to have me. Um, (laughs) and, And one night, she pulled out the hymnal and, and had Sharon and I play, a, or Sharon and me, play a game of Guess the Hymn, where she would give a little line of the hymn, and we would have to be the first to tell her what hymn it was. And I think by about the point where Sharon was beating me maybe 20 to 4 in Guess the Hymn, Marie started getting a little concerned that, that maybe I, would, I wouldn't like losing and, and would leave, and 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 she was working so hard to set us up, and I, I was already on board. Sharon took a little longer. Um, but so she started saying things like, oh, what is the score now? I think, I, I think it's just about tied. And, and I, I would play along, yeah, yeah, Grandma, I, I think it is. You're, you're right. Sharon, don't, don't correct your grandmother. <laughs> it's not polite. And, and then later she would say, okay, okay, now, now this one's worth 10 points, and... And, and Sharon, you can't play this round. <laughs> and, and that was a, a delightful night. And, and one of, after one of those nights, we, she was in the recliners holding hands with, with Pastor Frost. And, and we heard him say, you know, he doesn't come over to see you. <laughs> and she said, yes, but still, it's so nice. <laughs> so we, we love them tremendously. And... And for all the people she tried to set up in romantic relationships and failed, at least one time she was successful at it with with Sharon and me. So thank you. I want to talk about um, Mrs. Frost, Marie, and priorities. Um, And in the uh, obituary on the back page of the program, it talks about her being scatterbrained. Um, and I, it, th- that made me think maybe the reason why Linda and Sharon didn't come to school quite so often as my siblings and I did was because she forgot about school. Um, she, when they, they were, you could hardly come up with a reason why you didn't come. Well, my mom didn't make us. And <laughs> it was like, as you, as you well know, none of the Frost children suffered for their truancy, <laughs> whereas um, I suffered from school anxiety and was genuinely sick. And if I was vomiting in the morning from school anxiety, I was still made to go to school at noon. So there was no truancy for scattermindedness in our family. But that was just so puzzling to me. How does one just get to stay home from school and not know why? (laughs) And that may have been the beginning of the whole homeschooling phenomenon. (laughs) But she was obviously, that scatterbrainness went along with her genius. And um, if your brain is consumed with thinking about things that are 
more important than perfect attendance, you do get a lot of things done. And her whole family is kind of proof of that. A lot of out-of-the-box thinking that has done great things for our world. And not a whole lot of perfect attendance rewards. <laughs> We have time for a couple more, so come on up if you still want to share. Why don't you um, come up here to the podium so we know you're ready, and uh, we'll just finish with a few more. My name is Sue Garner. I met Marie and Pastor Frost in 1980 in Springfield, Illinois, when they were pastoring at Cherry Hills Baptist Church. And Marie uh, had a great impact on my life at that time, and... Uh, I just am thankful to her for that and doing that for me. But I did work uh, with Pastor Frost in the church there, but was very unusual that a pastor's wife at the time uh, had her own business. She owned a, a daycare center in Springfield. She also uh, started a Christian Faith Academy and uh, just was involved in all life of a lot of people there in the community there in Springfield. Uh, but the one thing I got to know, uh, Marie and Pastor, and followed them up here to Big Rock and the Aurora area, she loved to eat and to go out. But her family, some of them were really into health food. And so she would have to kind of sneak uh, uh, <laughs> chocolate and ice cream. And Cecile had just reminded me that I had forgotten one thing that she'd call and she'd say, would you like to go for sinful pie? <laughs> <laughs> and so we'd go over to Colonial in Aurora and uh, have ice cream and pie. And she always would have something at the house. Uh, and I wanted, I almost brought her some chocolate to go put on her uh, grave today. Um, she always wanted to have chocolate and different, but she had to hide it. I don't know if that happened later on in life, but uh, <laughs> but I just am so thankful that Marie was a part of my life and for the influence that she had, and especially for Christ in following him. Good afternoon. When you're an international student, um, a lot of times we have a term that we fondly call um, your American parents. And so for Huntley, when he came here, Mrs. Frost became his American mom. And so when I met um, the Frost later um, in Huntley's journey with them, she became a real advocate for me. She fought, you know, for our relationship. And despite the age difference, she truly became a friend to me. And there's so many things that I learned from her. I mean, her gift of hospitality, when she could have, you know, 20, 25 people over to her house and not make it look effortless. And, you know, sometimes I'd have two people over and I'm frazzled and I would think back on just how effortlessly she handled it and how welcome she made everyone feel and just just what a blessing she was to our family. She really um, was an inspiration to us in a lot of ways. She's going to be greatly missed. So. Hi there. I'm uh, Debbie Frost Kennard, but I'm the California contingent. My um, my mother, who passed, gosh, my mom who passed away in the summer was her younger sister Anna, and then our dads were brothers. So I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> Double cousins. So we have all the same relatives. And all I wanted to say is, when I think of Marie, I think of legacy. You know just who she was to so many people, friends, the church. Her children have been so special in my life, and her children's children, and great-grandchildren, and they just keep going. They weren't even all up here. So I think of the legacy, and I just think as a young girl, I grew up in California, and if Marie was coming out, or I went to college out here too in both cases, so I could have been 18, 8 years old or 28 years old. And if Marie was going to breakfast at the Big Rock Cafe, I would drive 45 minutes to get there just to sit with her and hear her stories and 
not times my mom was there and my sister. And we just ate them. They were just pure gold in, you know, and you think, I was, a, you know, I had a million other things to do, but I wanted to sit there and just laugh and laugh and hear their stories on the farm and their meeting their husbands. And of course, that was a match, that was a match that worked with introducing the little brother to the little sister. And, uh, and I'm so thankful for that. And, and this is kind of funny. I sent this um, to, uh, oh, I might have, I lost it. But it was a, it was a letter. My mother passed, so we were going through all these things, and there was a ton of letters from Marie. She was so good. Many people have mentioned that about reaching out and caring. And it was, it was reminiscent how they used to shop and how they'd run from one bank to another to cover their checks. <laughs> and then she wrote a little parenthesis, I still do. And she wrote, she wrote this at about 91. <laughs> so I got, that, uh, I got that gene, unfortunately, my husband knows. But uh, I could go on and on. Just from the, the California group, so many wonderful memories and such a great legacy. Thank you. My name is Rachel, and um, I was the nighttime caregiver for three days a week, three to four days a week for the past year. And before I even share, I just want to honor all the other ladies and say that they did a wonderful, amazing job and taught me so much as well. But I just want to share this, and I'm going to read it just because I don't want to misquote anything. But when Maggie reached out to me a year ago about being a caregiver for Marie, I was very aware that the Lord was giving me an opportunity and privilege. I also knew when I accepted the position that this was the only way it would end, that we would be here, she'd be gone, and I'd miss her. And as we became acquainted and shared our lives through the night hours, praying, singing, reminiscing, and laughing, I knew we were forming a bond. I just was not aware how much she was impacting me, how much God was using her to press and form me. I did not know she would teach me about love and giving myself so completely, teaching me to love in a whole new way and taking me to a different place. I did not know how hard it would be to say goodbye. I could not know the impact it would have and how I'd be forever changed. Marie was my friend. She was a woman of great strength and vigor. Though I knew her in her most vulnerable and frail season, I saw who she was. I saw the powerful force of love and kindness that was the energy behind her. Marie had the gift of being able to see people like Jesus does. There might be a thousand negatives, but Marie would find the positive, even if it was only one thing. She'd find something positive and build on that. She'd find common ground and sow into it what was good in order to build others up. She was strong and determined in life, but she was just as determined and single-minded in her loving and in the compassion she offered. She served the Lord well. She loved him well. As we prayed, I saw how she loved Jesus sweetly and softly, but also fiercely. She was precious in his sight. The last night she was able to communicate with me, though her voice was weak and it was laborious to talk. She said, my life is almost over, and she was focused on expressing how good God is and how he has blessed her with family and relationships. She wanted to sing, God is so good, and then later, Jesus loves me. She tried to join in as I sang. I felt it was important to her to act upon her reflection of the blessings in her life and in her own way declare her knowledge of Jesus' love by singing, Jesus loves me. Her voice was weak. My friend, who loved words, who was never speechless, spoke very few words that night, but she expressed completely her love for God and her thankfulness for each of you, her friends and dear, dear family. She treasured you. She prayed for you each night. We prayed together. And she thanked the Lord for salvation and for Daddy showing her the way. It was an honor and gift to be a part of her life. I can never express all God has given by allowing me the opportunity to know her. She was an amazing woman. I'm going to be quick. Um, that was beautiful. I can't uh, follow some of the stuff that's been said, but I just wanted to uh, share a very quick story that happened recently uh, regarding her, um, and then 
talk about one of her most, I think, important spiritual gifts. But recently I went to the dentist for the first time in way too long, and I'd happened to be the same dentist uh, that Marie helped keep in business for quite some years. Um, this was Dr. Holdridge, and you know the uh, the hygienist came in, and she said, "Oh my goodness, I haven't seen your grandmother for a while." I said, "Yeah, well, you did all you could for her, and that was thank you." Um, but she said, "Oh, she's still writing," and I said, "You know, yeah, she is. She's always writing." And she said, "No, she, last time I was in here, she gave me one of her books." And for those of you who were involved in some of those projects, who read those books, she got a she got very free verse toward the end of it. Um, <laughs> And so this book that she had given her was was a little uh, book called Farmer uh, Farmer Appleby and Piggy D, I believe. And for those of you who <laughs> you're laughing, you know. And she said, and I said, oh, okay. Well, did you enjoy it? And she said, you know, I took it to my kids' school, and it's now one of their favorite books. So she's even extending into into you know public school rooms uh, with in unexpected ways. But the one thing I did want to say about her um, that I think a lot of you in this room know was how encouraging she was. And uh, I, I was lucky enough to have very loving parents who encouraged me a lot. Um, they were also very aware of my shortcomings because there were a lot of them. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that Grandma ever was aware of mine or of anybody else's, uh, because the one thing that she did do uh, was do like Jesus did and go out and find uh, the loneliest. Uh, sometimes most broken people. Not that she wasn't friends with everybody, but uh, that was often who she took extra effort and extra care in, in reaching out to. And you know, I can't tell you how many times um, my mom was <laughs> rolling her eyes and lying awake at night over something stupid or ridiculous that I had done, whether it was a an ear piercing or a, a, a tattoo <laughs> or something else. And uh, and Grandma always was there to say, well, you know, I don't like it, but maybe it's not that bad. <laughs> and, uh, and and I knew this was really true um, when, when I told her, uh, after much trepidation, that I had become Catholic. And she looked at me, she goes, well, then maybe Catholics can't be that bad either. <laughs> And that she really loved me. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's how I wanted to remember her. Her just endless spirit of encouragement um, and the way, the way that she reached out. And uh, I'm sure she's going to get to heaven and Jesus isn't going to have anything to say when he said, you know, when did you, when did you feed me? When did you give me food? When did you encourage me? I don't think he's going to have anything to say to her because I don't think she ever missed an opportunity. I'm sure many of you have stories and other things you'd like to share, but I'm going to ask Maggie if she just close our time um, and share something. I also had to write this down because there was no way. <laughs> I was remembering. I'm just been shaking this whole time, and my acting teacher slash friend slash colleague Mark Lewis is here, and he always taught me that when you shake, it's because something matters. And that's how it feels. Um, okay. There is a story I have heard many times. Oh, nope, 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 nope. just want to tilt it. Many times that is it's in so many times that it's emblazoned on my brain forever and has become almost apocryphal. Grandma was going to marry Kenny. Handsome, smart, charming, rich Kenny. They were engaged to be married, but Grandma kept hearing her dad's voice in her head, thou shalt not be unequally yoked. This voice led her home to Harris, Iowa to get her father's blessing the day before the wedding. Who takes a trip the day before their wedding? Grandma. Well, I don't think it's best for you, kid, her father said, but if that's what you want, I'll take you there tomorrow. That night, the most outrageous snowstorm in Iowa history hit their tiny town, and when they woke up, they couldn't open the door. Kenny called. Marie, the guests are arriving. Where are you? I can't get out of my house. The snow's too deep, she exclaimed. If you wanted to be here, you would be here, he said. Marie, I don't think you really want to marry me. Oh, but I do. I just can't get there, she said. <laughs> you know what, Kenny said? The guests are all here. The food has been paid for. 
And there's a girl here who's always wanted to marry me. <laughs> I think I'll just marry her instead. <sighs> oh, kid. Gra Grandma always sighed when she said this. I felt so relieved. <laughs> I just didn't know how to say no to him. I just couldn't say no. That snowstorm has always been my personal metaphor for God's grace. 75% of the people in this room wouldn't even exist if it weren't for that one single <laughs> epic snowstorm. I love that story because it is imprinted on me the detail in which God watches over our lives and the way in which he orders every single moment. This life is not a crapshoot. For the past decade, I have been a metaphorical gypsy. My least favorite question to answer, one that gets, I get asked all the time, has been, what are you up to these days? Uh, taking care of toddlers, cooking for cancer patients, cleaning friends' houses everywhere, writing mediocre country music. No husband, no kids, no actual career, and none of it has ever made any sense to me or anyone who asks until this past year. Because before this year, if anything in my life had been, quote, worked out, I would have missed out. Because spending this year with Grandma is the most important thing I've ever done in my 36 years of life. It wasn't a calling or an assignment or something I felt obligated to do. It was a gift. It changed me on a cellular level. My heart grew in ways I didn't know it could grow, and I learned a patience I didn't know existed. And I've thought many times since her passing, she could have gone a year ago with Grandpa, but she stuck around to give us a profound gift. As Sharon Stevenson said, Grandma lived this long so she could teach us how to love. And no, we weren't perfect at it, and she wasn't either. <laughs> But perfection isn't the goal. The goal is in the trying. The goal is in the struggle to love. It's like Colin said, it's in the looking past people's faults, insecurities, and habitual patterns, the things that drive you nuts and make you need to take a time out. I took many of those. And looking beyond all these things, the goal is in the seeing, really seeing and loving the vulnerable human that God made and cherishes. God and Grandma, they never gave up. Well, they never give up on anyone. There were many times this past year when I got fed up, many times that I was extremely bored. There's only so many times you can re-edit Diggy Dog and Friends. There were many, many times she was difficult and feisty and just hard to be around, but none of those moments, even for a second, made me love her any less. Because Grandma, Grandma embedded in me over thousands of specific moments throughout my entire life the impenetrable moral code of not giving up on people. This code has bitten me in the butt more than once in my dating life. It's caused me many a heartbreak and many a friendship, but I still cling to it with everything in me because she was so, so, so very loyal and really knew how to love without condition. One of those many ways she expressed this love was through her extreme generosity. She was so eager to give money to everyone, it became something we had to mitigate the past year because, well, she didn't have any money. She would get her meager social security check and whatever she received would be gone within 24 hours. And she didn't have a car or access to the internet. I finally realized we could solve this problem by buying prop money off Amazon. You already told this story, but we kept a small bucket by the door. Grandma was so delighted to be able to give away hundreds of dollars to whomever arrived. And then I would instruct them to deposit it back in the bucket as they left. An actor friend of mine from New York played Cindy, a teller from Hinkley Bank, who assured Grandma many a time over the phone that I was emptying her bank account on a weekly basis. It was a fairly well-oiled machine until we went to the garage sale. <laughs> I took her because Grandma loved garage sales. She would often host them in her younger years, not to make money necessarily, mainly to evangelize. I think she mostly just gave everything away. Anyway, on this particular outing, Grandma was not able to walk, so I'd leave her in the car with the window down and ask if there was anything she'd like to see. Find me a book about rabbits, she said. Okay, I said, and would go in and talk to whomever was there, ask if they had a book about rabbits, and also explain why I needed to park my car in their driveway so that my 103-year-old grandma could view their cachet. And they would all come out in amazement just to be in the presence of someone that old. 
At one particular house, I got out of the car and was negotiating a price for a hot tub when I looked over and saw a woman putting a suspiciously crisp $50 bill with Chinese writing on it into the cash drawer. <sighs> Excuse me, I said, um, but where did you get that? Just, From the lady in the car, she said, pointing at Grandma, who was careening her neck out the window. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry, I said softly so Grandma couldn't hear. Um, that's not real money. It's, it's a very long story. Uh, <laughs> Grandma had negotiated through the car window without my knowledge the purchase of two very large animatronic musical candle-holding Christmas dolls from $20 down to 10 which then I had to purchase with the only real cash I had in my wallet. I love how powerful she was. Even at 103, she knew how to take things into her own hands, and she did the same at 104. Over the past year, she kept saying, Maggie, I want to go home. I want to go see my daddy. Help me go home. Well, Grandma, you can go home whenever you want to, I'd say. How do I get there, she'd say. Well, I don't know any other way to say this, but if you want to go see daddy and like be with him all day, every day, Grandma, you have to die. Die? She'd say, I'm not going to die. Okay, okay, I say, that's fine. I, I don't want you to die. I'm just letting you know how this works. Um, we want you here as long as you want to be here. And this exact conversation repeated itself over and over for months and months and months. Until December came and her, I want to go home, had a different ring to it. There was a piece to it. After getting out of the hospital, she said, everybody's talking about me and how they wish I was gone. No one's saying that, Grandma. I said, yes, they are. I heard them. Well, I said, then I'm going to go punch him in the nose. She was quiet for a moment and then said, punch him in the stomach. <laughs> she was bold. She was brave. She was courageous. But most of all, she was loving. And our many wonderful caregivers are a testimony to this. I'll never forget the morning I walked downstairs to check on her, and Vanessa was sleeping with her head resting on Grandma's shoulder. So cozily, you would have thought she was snuggling with her own Grandma. And I knew she wasn't doing that because it was her job, because we never asked her to do that. Grandma just had a way of winning everyone over. As sassy as she was, as opinionated, as candid, and as stubborn as she could be, she was still warm and loving and kind and open and tender and so, so vulnerable. As quick as she was to sass at you, she was even more quick to apologize. Whew. She did not calcify in her last years. She didn't become rigid and detached. She remained winsome, open, and engaged. And she was just hilarious. I laughed out loud more this last year than I have in my entire life. The things that came out of that woman's mouth quick, witty, creative, brilliant, with a vocabulary, of a vocabulary that could rival anyone in this room, and zero filter. <laughs> she had no shame, no propriety, but she was fierce in her love and loyalty. She was brilliant, creative, but knew how to not take herself too seriously. She was just magnificent. The day before she died, somehow I knew it was coming, and I went for a walk down a snowy trail, wooded trail near our home. Thankfully, I was alone in those woods because I couldn't stop crying. And I asked myself, why? Why are you so sad if you knew this was coming? Because I've been grieving this one for a long time. I had a dream 10 years ago that Grandma died, and I sobbed both in my dream and after I woke up. I knew at the time that was God preparing me for the eventuality of her death. Every time I've said goodbye to Grandma over the past decade, it's been heartbreaking not knowing if I'd see her again and wishing I'd have more time with her. And then I got it, copious amounts of time. God has been preparing me for this moment for a decade. I got all the time I could ask for, and it's still sad. A friend told me earlier this year that he'd read somewhere that taking care of the elderly is similar to taking care of a baby, except there's no hope for life in the end, for life and a future in the end, only death. That statement framed this year for me like reading cliff notes of a book. I knew the ending, so why was I so sad? And why am I so sad? Because she was so, so, so very alive. And when that aliveness is gone, there's a very specific missing, a deep and inconsolable missing of the spark, the ingenuity, the spontaneous outburst, the unpredictable nature of an unreservedly unique and wholly irreplaceable life. And isn't that the goal? 
that even after living 104 years, we are still missed profoundly because no one could ever replace us. I'm strangely grateful for this sadness because I know it means I was lucky, so very lucky, to have loved and to have been loved by such a woman. It's the last page. I know it was both deeply humbling and frustrating for her to be shuffled around, bathed, changed, and wiped. She was such a force of nature. For the good part of a century, she was in charge, autonomous, and self-possessed, and here she was, like a baby, a very tall, extremely verbal baby. (laughs) She kept... She kept saying to me, kid, why do you do this for me? And I would say, because I love you, Grandma. I don't know why, kid, she'd say. I'm such a mess. Well, I don't care, I'd say. I'm also a mess. Does that make you love me any less? Well, no, but I think you're perfect, she said. (laughs) Exactly, Grandma. Exactly. I think you're perfect, too. I'm so deeply grateful to be able to say that in the end, after watching her day in and day out over the past year, observing her moods and noting the tone of her voice and the emotion behind that tone, that she was ready. And it was her peaceful choice to surrender. And it wasn't because she was sad or angry or tired or bored. She was just ready. Rachel asked her just a few weeks ago, do you need anything, Marie? Grandma replied softly, no, my life is complete. In her last days, in the last words she could articulate, she was talking about a birthday party she wanted to plan for her son, Mark, the gifts she wanted to buy for the entire family at some random flower shop an hour away that were shaped like birds you could somehow stuff money into, and, of course, the books she needed to get to Tony. She never stopped creating, never stopped giving, and never stopped loving. The very last words of hers that I could make out were barely audible, but she had said them so many times, and not just to me, that I'd learned to read her lips. You're a sweetheart, she said. The way you are taken care of when you are old, when your kids are all grown, and you don't have a job, and you can't cook or write or do anything remotely important, is a direct reflection of how well you loved. I took care of Grandma because I know in my bones she would have done the exact same for me. I'll take care of you too, Maggie, she'd often say, when you're old. (laughs) I might be hobbling around, but I'll take care of you too. And I know she will. When Gene called and asked if I would sing, he had a specific song in mind, and it's one that I'd never heard before, but I think many of you probably have, so I've learned it this week. Um, It's probably, if you have heard it or know it, it's going to be very different uh, than the version that you've heard, because this version is about Marie Frost. It's called Thank You. Dreamed I went to heaven And you were there with me Walked along the streets of gold Beside the crystal sea We heard the angels singing Then someone called your name You turned and saw a young man He was smiling as he came He said, friend, you may not know me now. Then he said, but wait. You used to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. And every week you'd say a prayer before the class would start. And one morning when you said that prayer, I asked Jesus in my heart. So thank you 
for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. Then a woman stood before you and said, I read your book. A good friend gave it to me. That was all it took. I was facing tough times near the end of my rope. I picked it up and started reading. And that book gave me hope. So thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. One by one they came As far as the eye could see Each one somehow touched By your generosity You helped me turn that scary mountain Into a little hill You invited me to church You helped me pay a bill we wouldn't have stayed married if it hadn't been for you. There's so much more to say, and it's long since overdue. I could call you on the phone morning, noon, and night when all around was darkness. You turned on the light I had no family I could be with On Thanksgiving Day So you took me into yours And that's why I'm here to say Thank you For giving to the Lord I am a life that was changed Thank you For giving to the Lord I am so glad you gave Then Jesus came and took your hand And said now you can see when you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. Amen. I've invited our friends in the choir loft. They're not going to sing for us this morning, but I'm going to ask them to stand in the back so they can see this final portrait and then we'll close with song by
to his good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust in the Rejoice in my defeat. Pretty good. Yeah. Right? Yep. Thank you, Jesus. All is well when I where it's quiet. You can be with me. I know that's the way you want it. I do, that's the way you want it to be. Amen. Dreams, dreams, wonderful dreams. Coming down for the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above. So it sweeps over my spirit forever, I pray, sweeps over my spirit with love.
You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when stars are gray. You never know how much you love me. <laughs> what are you doing? I did not give you permission to take my uh, identity of, of the, the away from me. But you got such a cute figure, why don't you play it up? <laughs> hey? How would I play it up? Well, I'll tell you how. You could wear a little less clothing. <laughs> I didn't think that was so funny. Did you? Did that hit you speechless? Yes. I'm not gonna, I'm not, I don't have an opinion. <laughs> oh, dear. I feel sorry for people who become speechless. <laughs> they become speechless. <laughs> they can't think of a blessed thing to say. <laughs> but you can, right? Always. <laughs> love lifted me. Love lifted me. Where does else could help? Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, and when no one else could help, love <laughs> lifted me. Love lifted me. What's all that about? Love lifted me. Where nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. Where nothing else could help, love lifted me. Pretty good. Pretty good. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are sweet, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. And that's why I do know it's true, because the Bible says it was true to you and me. <laughs> <laughs> you bring out the worst of me. You know that, don't you? This is the worst? This is the best of you. Yeah. We feel like this is actually this is your best. You are your best self. This is exactly what you're trying to bring out. My best self. Yes. Dear Thanks. lady, have you ever had me at my height of entertainment? <laughs> Um, <laughs> have you known my height of entertainment? Oh, then show us your height of entertainment. trying to trick me. If I tell them, I'll give away my secret. I won't do it. <laughs> hey, what do you want?
light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I'm going to be reading this on behalf of my dad. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Lately, it's been a lot to say goodbye to friends and family. A few months ago, I said goodbye to Dr. Eugene Frost. Now it's time to say goodbye to Mrs. Frost. The journey of life is filled with many unknowns. At the same time, we serve the God of the unknown. When I first came to America in 1984, there were many unknowns. I had no idea traveling with the Judson University Choir would open the door for me to meet Mrs. Frost and family. From the first day I met her at a Judson Choir concert, she welcomed me into her home and treated me like a son. Too many stories to share. The dinners, and she was one incredible cook. The prayers, the advice, her love for Annette, and encouraging me to marry her. Her unwavering support, her encouraging me to play two numbers in church every Sunday. This was pivotal in my musical development. Without me knowing, God was using her to encourage me to practice and arrange songs in order to prepare me for the future. I still arrange all the songs I play thanks to her encouragement. Her Sunday school class, where I learned so much, her fierce defense of her husband. If you wanted to experience her toughness, try talking bad about her husband. Her love for Pastor Frost was amazing to witness, and God gave them 74 years of marriage. I am the musician, father, husband, and pastor I am today because of the godly influence of Mrs. Marie Frost and Pastor Eugene Frost. Mrs. Frost, you are no longer here, but your legacy will live on forever. RIP and greet, and greet Pastor Frost for us.
the family to follow the casket out of the sanctuary. Invite all our friends to stay for lunch. Um, it's been a long service. We want you to be refreshed and, and we'll be back for fellowship here. But here, now hear the benediction. Father God, we thank you for the life of Hattie Marie Frost. And we pray that all that has been said and done here today will rebound to your glory and your purposes. For we pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.